Okay, so in this lecture, we're going to uh, first go over the antibody structure and then discuss what occurs within the lymph node. So this over here is the general structure of the antibody, and you should have learned a couple of the different regions of them. So this part that's here at the top, is this the variable or is this the constant region? Variable, yes, yeah, so it's variable, it can change. So you have the variable region here at the top, and then the part then from the squiggly line all the way down, what is that? Constant, good, so we have the constant region. So some of the other features of the antibody, so this part that's here in blue, this is what's known as the heavy chain, and then the part that's here in red, this is what's known as the light chain. So the naming of them is just based on molecular weight. Obviously the heavy chain is going to have more mass. And the next question I have for you is, where does antigen bind to on the antibody? Is it the variable or is it the constant region? Variable. Variable. And so at the top of the variable region, we have what's known as the antigen binding site. Some of the other features, so this uh, squiggly line here in purple, this is what's known as the hinge region. And the hinge region, there is a disulfide bond that's connecting them together. Okay, so now I want to uh, go over a couple of different uh, concepts that relate to antigen diversity and why it's the case that these antibodies are specific to the antigen that they bind, depending on whatever the pathogen that is present. So uh, one of the first things that can happen, so at the variable region, something occurs which is known as somatic hypermutation. So we've already discussed that the antigen binds at this particular site. Well, we want to have favorable interactions there. We want to have high binding affinity, meaning that at this particular site, there are amino acids which have chemical complementarity. Because remember, this here is a, is a protein, and what can happen is the amino acids that are found at this particular region, we can change these amino acids for ones that have favorable uh, chemical complementarity, meaning that they match. So for instance, if you think of like non-covalent bonds, so for instance, like hydrogen um, bonding, that's an example. So we wanna have favorable interactions to make sure that there's a tight fit because we don't want to let the antigen go. Okay, so that's somatic hypermutation. The next thing that can happen, uh, which occurs within the constant region, so within the constant region, it's called isotype switching. So the isotype is what gives the antibody its identity. So for instance, IgM, IgA, IgG, and so on, that's how we can identify it. Well, you've already kind of learned that the different antibodies, the immunoglobins, they have different functions. So we can change whatever the isotype is for uh, one that's specific to the pathogen that is present. So for isotype switching, we can change from IgM to, for instance, IgG. Okay, so constant in the variable region, we've discussed some of these concepts. So now what we're going to learn once we get into the lymph node is where does this happen? Okay, so the general anatomy here of the lymph node, you have both of these vessels here and then there's another vessel coming in or another vessel over here. So what do we call this one where lymph is flowing inside? Is it? Yes, afferent. So you have the afferent vessel and then the one that leaves? Efferent vessel. Good. So then 
the different regions of the lymph node. So this part here in red, that's what's known as the cortex. This part here in blue, that's what's known as the medulla. Um, this region where you have the efferent vessel, as well as um, arteri or arteries and then veins here, all of this is within a region which is known as the hilum. Okay, so that's uh, the general anatomy. And the next thing that I want to bring up is I talked about a dendritic cell. So the reason I have it drawn here in the middle is because the dendritic cell is the, the key player here, which helps us to go from the innate immunity to the adaptive immunity. So wherever there is a site, uh, wherever the site is for infection, if the innate immunity cannot take care of it, so for instance, like the neutrophils, if they can't get rid of it, we need our dendritic cells. So what the dendritic cells will do, they're at that particular site wherever um, there's an injury occurs or there's a type of infection, and then the dendritic cell will take it to the nearest lymph node. So the dendritic cell, let me draw it here in purple. So the dendritic cell, it's shaped, it's like, like a star-shaped structure, and it'll enter here through the afferent lymph. And it gets into the region here within the, within the cortex. And once it gets to this cortex, it, the dendritic cell is what's known as an antigen presenting cell, meaning that it'll present whatever the antigen that it was exposed to, to the helper T cells. So it's an antigen presenting cell and it's also a phagocyte. A phagocyte is something that it engulfs things. So the dendritic cell, it'll engulf it, break it down, and then that antigen will be shown here for antigen presentation, so that way it interacts here with the T cell. So when, when the dendritic cell gets into the cortex, it'll interact with either a CD4 T cell or a CD8 T cell within the cortex. And are CD4 and CD8 T cells, are these effector cells? No, they're not. What, are, what is the effector for a CD4 T cell? The helper T helper. Yeah, the T helper, the helper T cells. So um, during activation, so they get activated and then they undergo a process which is known as differentiation and proliferation, they will differentiate into, once they're presented with antigen, antigen to a CD4, will become a T helper cell. And we've already identified the different types of T helper cells. For instance, T1, T2, T17, and then T regulatory. Okay, so we have um, our effector cell, and notice the location of where I wrote, I wrote this. Because we're getting antigen presentation over here, and then we're, as this process is occurring, we're pushing the effector cells towards the medulla, right? Because that's where we want to get them to, is here within the uh, efferent lymphatics. So it can go to its uh, particular site. And so, we get differentiation and proliferation, and then another thing is that we get the production of our memory. Because remember, we have memory T cells, and then you'll also get the production of memory B cells. So for adaptive immunity, this is a key difference between innate and adaptive, is that the adaptive immunity has memory. So once again, this is why vaccines work. Because once you're exposed to the antigen, you acquire the machinery that's specific to that antigen. Okay, what if we activate a CD8 T cell? What does this develop into? Cytotoxic. Yeah, a cytotoxic T cell. And the cytotoxic T cells, remember, they are specific for intracellular, um, intracellular pathogens. So for instance, like viruses and cancer, they'll travel to wherever that antigen is and uh, whatever the cell that is, and then they'll lyse it. Uh, so one other topic that 
you're going to, it's going to be introduced into lecture is the MHC. So it stands for Major Histocompatibility uh, Complex. So it's MHC1 and MHC2. So keep this in your mind. So MHC1, that's what's found on all of the nucleated cells. So the CD8 or the cytotoxic T cells, they'll bind to the cells that are displaying the MHC1 that has the antigen. But all of the, there's a couple other di different antigen presenting cells. They have what's known as MHC class two. Okay. All right. So now that we know the differentiation, proliferation, we get the production of our memory T cells. They're specific for uh, whichever uh, pathogen is present. The next thing is, well, what if we have an activated CD4 T cell? What happens? So I'm going to do this in purple. So within the cortex, there is a particular region which is known as the germinal center. And right off the bat, the germinal center is the site for B cell proliferation. Meaning that these B cells, they're multiplying, okay? But they're not gonna multiply until they're exposed to their specific um, antigen. So what will happen is, for instance, if we have a CD4 T cell that's activated, it'll interact with our B cell. And once again, is the B cell is that an effector cell? No, it's not. What is the effector cell? Plasma cells. So within the medulla, this is where we're gonna have our developed, our plasma cells. And the plasma cells, what do they do? Yeah, they secrete. They make them, but they secrete the antibodies. So for instance, a plasma cell, if I drew it here, it'll have the antibodies here at the apical surface. And then from here, it can get released, and then it'll then travel through the, um, through the efferent uh, lymphatic system. Okay, so talked about the germinal centers, the B cell proliferation. We have an activated CD4 T cell, interacts with the B cell, it becomes a um, plasma cell. And at the germinal center, this is the site where what we were just talking about earlier, so somatic hypermutation as well as isotype switching occurs. And once we get the, prolifer the proliferation of the B cells, they'll become plasma cells and then we also get our memory B cells. Okay, uh, so one other thing that I want to mention is the macrophages. So uh, macrophages are found within majority regions of the lymph node, and what are they? So macrophages are they come from monocytes, right? Because monocytes circulate in the blood and then macrophage is what the monocyte differentiates into. Um, but they are phagocytes and they can become activated by um, T helper cells. So that's um, one other thing that I wanted to mention. Okay, so that's gonna do it for this lecture.